Soldiers of the Press. In and out of Hawaii move the ships, the planes, and the men who are carrying the fight to the Japanese in the scattered islands and on the broad sea lanes of the Pacific. And with them go the correspondents of the United Press, recording epic events at such remote points as New Guinea, Midway, the Solomons. For Honolulu is as much an operations base for war correspondents as for the fleet. We bring you now the story of a man who has seen as much or more of action in the Pacific than any other of the Corps of Correspondents whose home base is Honolulu. United Press Correspondent William Tyree. I've been covering the war in the Pacific since the day it began. In fact, in terms of the newspaper men passing through Honolulu since Pearl Harbor, I'm looked upon as something of a veteran war correspondent. You see, I was transferred to Honolulu as night manager of the United Press Bureau more than a year before the Japs staged their sneak raid on Hawaii. Like every other American who watched the smoke billowing up from burning ships and aircraft on December 7th, I was hopping mad. My first impulse was to join one of the armed forces in order to get a direct crack at the nips. So I dropped in on my boss, Frank Tremaine, late one afternoon, a few days later, to talk it over. Hello, Bill. Come on in. Thanks, Frank. If you've got a few minutes, I'd like to talk over a personal problem with you. Certainly. What's on your mind? Well, Frank, I'm still sore at the way the Japanese dragged us into this war. And I've been considering enlistment. I'm husky, hale and hardy, have no flat feet, and possess the prescribed number of teeth. Uh-huh, I see. I don't know just where I'd fit in, but I think I'd make a passable buck private. I see, Bill. And I can sympathize with your sentiments. In fact, I've even turned the same ideas over in my own mind. Yeah? I think all of us out here who saw what happened in the harbor and at Hickam Field feel pretty much the same. But here's a point I'd like you to consider. As you said, you don't know where you'd fit in the Army. A buck private, remember? Okay, buck private. But look, Bill, you're a trained man working on a job that's vitally important to the war effort. Gathering the news, getting it right, and getting it out. It's taken six years to make a foreign correspondent of you, and, well, you're a good one. <laughs> Thanks. The point is... I'm not so sure the Army could make a good buck private of you. <laughs> you like to sleep late of mornings too darn well. <laughs> no cracks. Remember, I work nights. But look, I want to see the show when we start handing it back to the Japs. I want to be in on that. Well, Bill, you will. You're going to be accredited as UP correspondent with the Pacific Fleet. That's strictly between us for the present. But it's going through, and you'll be seeing plenty of action. Well, Pacific Fleet assignment. That sounds more like it. Well, Bill, as I look at it, you'll be doing an important job, which you can do well if you stick. How about it? Good point. And if it means a chance to really get into some action, I'm still your man. Well, I stuck. And as for action, I've had a year jam-packed with it. Small operations with task forces at first. Then I really got into the thick of it in the Coral Sea. I had a ringside seat for that one aboard a U.S. cruiser. I got my initiation of bombing and learned to duck when Jap planes came close enough to rake our decks with machine gun fire. I saw the 33,000-ton Lexington ripped by torpedoes and bombs, saw her heel over and go down, and I wiped tears from my eyes as her rescued crew members watched her disappear. But during that four-day engagement, I also saw the beginnings of America's repayment of Japan's treachery at Pearl Harbor five months earlier. I talked with an American pilot who had dropped a 1,000-pound bomb squarely on the flight deck of a Jap aircraft carrier. He told me... Boy, when that bomb hit, it was terrific. That Jap carrier opened up like a volcano. And next day, I cheered with the crew when the skipper announced the score over the ship's public address system. The enemy has been definitely halted for the moment. Our best estimates are that he has paid for the destruction of the Lexington with the loss of 23 and possibly 24... Japanese warships. Our observers report that the enemy has withdrawn and that contact has been lost. So, for the time being, this cruiser will not get a whack at his ships. But this will be a long war. We will catch him again. Every time he steps out, we'll snip off his ships. Then, when his naval power is exhausted, 
we can roll right up to Tokyo. We will catch him again. The skipper had promised it, and that's what we did. For weeks, we were constantly on the alert. Everyone was convinced that the Japanese fleet was reforming to strike another blow. And it came on the 4th of June. Our ship's radio crackled with the electrifying news. Strong force of enemy ships sighted by Navy patrol planes 700 miles off Midway. The ship's bugles sound general quarters and I make a dash for the bridge where I'll have access to the ship's fighter circuit radio. Hello, Tyree. You're always yelling for action, so get set. This looks like the blow-off. Big pack of nips out front, huh? Right. Observers say the enemy has 80 or more warcraft headed this way. Hey, wait a minute. Listen. Our carrier is sending up her planes. Oh, I look at them. A comforting sight. Here, let's cut in the fighter circuit. Spotted them. Prepare to repel attack. Jap fighter and torpedo planes. 12 miles. Step on it. I can't see anything. Don't be impatient. Even at 300 miles an hour, 12 miles is a bit of a hop, you know. Use your glasses. Yep, here they come. Check. Now I can make them up. Just above the waves. Man, look at them. Come. Torpedo planes. They're the bad ones. That's firing. Sit tight. This is it. Good Lord, did you see that one explode? Four of them can't take our fire. They're pulling up to get out. Hey, look. One of our own fighters. He's coming straight into our fire to get that jab. Oh, wow, the Jap's down and he's zoomed up out of it. Man, what a guy. There come the torpedoes. See the wake? Yeah. Hey, one's going to be close. Yes, it's going to... No, it's wide, 500 yards off our bow. Hey, there comes one plane straight for us. My God, I believe he's going to try to crash us. He's just about... We got him! Boy, oh, boy, that was too close for comfort. The attack had been beaten off and I suddenly became aware that our public address system was cut in on a report from Midway. Enemy ships, including battleships, carriers, cruisers, and transports, have been hit many times by our bombers. We hear there are three enemy ships burning satisfactorily 170 miles off Midway. News comes that we have destroyed two enemy carriers and have badly damaged two others. You remember the final score of that battle? Ten Japanese warships, including four aircraft carriers, sunk. At least eight other warships damaged. The Japs driven back from Midway. By the time we put back in at Pearl Harbor, I'd made up my mind on another assignment I wanted. The performance of American aircraft in the Coral Sea and at Midway had given me a yen to have a closer look at air war from the belly of a bomber bent on business. I asked for and got an assignment with the U.S. Air Force in the South Pacific. I had the pleasure of craning my neck over the open door of the bomb bay of a flying fortress. I've watched her bombs fall away to dissolve in blasts of flame and smoke from Japanese installations on Buka Airfield in the northern Solomons. I'd come to think of myself as something of a case-hardened war correspondent until one day not long ago when our big B-17 sat down on Henderson Field on Guadalcanal. I dropped to the runway and spotted a Marine sergeant who looked like he could supply the information I wanted. Hey, sergeant. Yeah? Got a minute? Sure, buddy. What do you want? I just came in on that B-17. I'm a newspaper man, William Tyree of United Press. Glad to know you. Hiya. We're supposed to have a guy down here named Francis McCarthy. You know where I can locate him? Sure, sure thing. He'd be with the rest of them correspondents at press tent. Now, come on. It's not far. I'll show you. Thanks. Say, um, by the way, uh... How are McCarthy and the rest of your news hawks making out? Ah, they're doing all right. They're plenty tough. <laughs> if you ask me, you newspaper guys ain't bright. A Marine? Well, me, for instance. If I'm going to get it, I'm going to get it. But, brother, I'm not asking to get myself bumped off standing on top of a hill like you dumb newspaper men with your cameras and portable typewriters. I located the Guadalcanal press tent, and I learned what the sergeant had meant. McCarthy had been on Guadalcanal for 30 days. He'd gone through two attacks of dysentery, half a dozen assorted tropical complaints, and had suffered a broken rib and a fall from a cliff while on patrol with the Marines. Sherman Montrose, a photographer for Acme News Pictures, had the same experiences to report, except for the broken rib. Bombing and shelling attacks were a daily routine, and life was rugged, to put it mildly. My first morning there will give you an idea. 
Hey, Tyree, come out of it. It's dawn. You'll miss the regular morning shelling if you don't hurry. Oh, for the love of Mike McCarthy, it isn't even light yet. Yeah, well, look, chum, we got to get out and get some breakfast and pronto. Go away. You hear that? Our Japanese neighbors are up and about. They're starting the shelling already. Oh, hello, Marty. Oh, hello, Mac. I can't seem to impress our friend here with the fact that breakfast is catch as catch can and now or never on Guadalcanal. Hello, Tyree. Now, look, Mac's right. You'll love it. Breakfast will be, and not for a change, pancakes without butter. They serve a concoction with them that's one part sugar and nine parts... Well, nine parts, what I suspect, is drainage from the crankcase of a Jeep. Oh, yeah. You'll get to wash it down with chlorinated coffee. Then you'll be set to start the day. Sounds swell. Well, I'll admit I can't resist that. For you six guys in this pup tent, make room for a man to stretch. Hey, that one was close. Uh, I think nothing of it, Bill. Wait till you meet our Japanese snipers. The woods are full of them. They're good, too. Yes, sir. They can knock the ashes off your cigarette at 200 yards. You can't see them either, you know. They perch in the trees all dressed in camouflaged green outfits and wham away at you. Sounds just lovely. <laughs> well, we're glad you like the idea. You see, that's our usual initiation for newcomers to the Guadalcanal press tent. Yeah. Come on, fellas. we got to get a move on. Let's take Tyree out and get him shot at. No, sorry, not me. I'm just passing through these parts. I'm going to climb back aboard my B-17 and go out on a nice, peaceful bombing raid. Actually, I stayed three days, and a good half of that time was spent in foxholes, dodging bombs and shells. I got that initiation by Jap snipers, too. I left just a short time before the Japanese made one of their biggest bids to recapture the strategic island. For three days of what McCarthy described as unmitigated hell, the Japanese hammered at American positions with continuous land, air, and sea attacks. Well, I'm convinced that the Guadalcanal press corps has seen as much action as anyone could want. And I know I've had plenty of opportunity for close contact with the enemy. Before this show is over... I hope to have plenty more, possibly even that ride to Tokyo, which every sailor, soldier, and flyer in our armed forces is aiming for. Yes, Tyree and McCarthy and scores of others on the worldwide staff of the United Press are seeing the great developments of this war at first hand, are reporting them direct from the scenes of action. They are living the adventures we bring to you in this series of programs, be sure to hear the next edition of Soldiers of the Press. And meanwhile, listen for United Press News on the air. Look for it in your favorite newspaper. It is your guarantee of the world's best coverage of the world's biggest news. <laughs>